Good morning. Um, Sarah said a lot already. I hope you'll have a wonderful conference. Um, all I wanted to do is thank our sponsors once more. We had four really big sponsors. Jazz Pharmaceuticals, Avadel Pharmaceuticals, um, Har Bioharmony Sciences Pharmaceuticals, and Diane and Sam Cornell. Uh, Diane and Sam Cornell live in San Diego. Um, we also had two sponsors, um, people who were supporting individual people, which is a really wonderful thing to do if any of you are interested in doing that for next year. Um, Emily Baker, who's here, she sponsored a trip she won. She gave it to someone else. And um, also, we have a very sweet story just happened last week. Someone's sister passed away. She had narcolepsy. And her other sister collected money for her birthday and made sure that with this birthday money, very last minute, two days ago, we were able to get a wonderful person here as well. So I'm, I'm really happy that these people were so uh, wonderful to sponsor other people. Um, I wanted to say one quick thing. Um, we have a very good campaign going on right now, sponsored by Avadel, uh, and it's called Lift Us Up. Um, the guys are from Holland, like me, who are, are here. They do some sessions, and they're hoping that some of you, these are the cards. My name, my name is, you would call me, um, and then you've probably seen these stories on Facebook. Then you fill in what a lot of people would call you. Um, it's very interesting. They're looking for more people. So if you're interested in being part of it, um, then go to the sessions. They have a session today and one tomorrow. So now I just need to uh, make an uh, announcement for Dr. Mignot. And there's a whole page for Dr. Mignot. I thought he was missing, but he's not in the elevator this morning. I could see I don't need to announce him at all. Everybody was like, oh, Dr. Mignot, Dr. Mignot. So um, I don't need to say who Dr. Mignot is. But we're very happy to have a lot of wonderful doctors here and, uh, and uh, other people, presenters. It's going to be a great weekend. So um, without further ado, Dr. Mignot. Thank you, Evelyn. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. Um, so I will talk to you about narcolepsy and the work that I've conducted over many, many years. Um, so actually, this is a little bit of the timeline of, of uh, narcolepsy and the various things that I'm going to cover. So as you can see, uh, narcolepsy was first described at the end of the 19th century. And uh, after, in 1918, I don't know if some of you are aware, there was this big uh, flu epidemic that actually killed more than 100 million people. That was called the Spanish flu. And it was kind of strange because a lot of patients did not recover, were very, very sleepy, and they, they just almost were comatose. And then when uh, this particular doctor, Van Economo, kind of looked at their brain, for, because actually about half were passing away, as they found that a region of the brain called the posterior hypothalamus was very damaged, and uh, as you will hear, that's where the cause of narcolepsy is. Then in the 30s, the first uh, stimulant treatments like amphetamine came about. In the 50s, you know, there were demonstrations that uh, narco REM sleep was discovered, and it was shown that narcolepsy patients go straight into rapid eye movement sleep, which explain, as you know, a lot of their symptoms. Then um, in the 70s, 80s, you know, the MSLT was, was uh, developed, which is a test where people nap um, uh, five times during the day, and then you can measure how fast they go into REM sleep, and that's probably the gold standard uh, for uh, narcolepsy. And um, later it was used to distinguish narcolepsy without cataplexy and idiopathic hypersomnia. In the 80s, you know, people started to notice that patients with narcolepsy and cataplexy had this particular uh, genetic marker called HLA, which is very important for the immune system, and I will talk to you about that a lot. And that gives the idea that maybe narcolepsy was an autoimmune disease, but nobody could really find anything about it. Uh, you know, if you looked at the brain of patients, everything seems to be totally fine. Or if you did imaging, you know, the 
everything was normal, so nobody could find what the immune system was doing. But then in the 2000s, we cloned the narcolepsy gene in a dog model, which uh, led us to discover that it's hypocretin that's involved, and uh, uh, that there are cells in the hypothalamus that are called hypocretin cells, which um, uh, are really causing narcolepsy when they are destroyed. And now we are discovering, which is back to uh, you know, the 1930s or 1918, that it's a flu that seems to trigger narcolepsy and, and, and kind of an immune process that then attacks the cells uh, that uh, produce hypocretin or rexin, and then you have uh, narcolepsy. And then now there's a lot of questions about where narcolepsy stops. You have narcolepsy with cataplexy and narcolepsy without cataplexy, idiopathic hypersomnia, and a lot of people are really trying to understand what's the spectrum of the disease. And I will try to talk about all this. This will be things that I'm covering through my talk. Um, so um, initially, narcolepsy, when it was described, was really described as this condition that had cataplexy. Uh, the first reports described patients that were tired all the time. But not only they were tired all the time, but what was really unusual is they would take a nap and they will feel better after, which is a bit different from patients with idiopathic hypersomnia. You know, even immediately after a nap, they will feel better, but it didn't last very long. Then they were tired again. And then when they were laughing, emotionally excited, something funny happened to them, they would suddenly collapse. And if you can start the video, you will see people would collapse. And then uh, maybe it's not working, which would, would not be a big deal, because I think a lot of you know what cataplexy is. Uh, they would collapse and be unable to, to move. And uh, they would be paralyzed, but awake. And that was uh, the equivalent to REM sleep paralysis because during REM sleep you are paralyzed and somehow, we don't, still don't really know why, but somehow emotional stimulation in patients with narcolepsy can produce this paralysis that looks like REM sleep. Patient would also wake up from a dream and still be paralyzed, which can be very scary. Uh, it's called sleep paralysis. Uh, people will go into REM sleep so quickly they will dream awake, which also was sometimes so vivid that they didn't know if it happened or not, and that could be very scary in patients with narcolepsy. Uh, and then uh, often the patient would not sleep very well because they fall asleep very easily, but then they wake up after one hour and they are, you know, as I said, you know, patients with narcolepsy feel better when they sleep, but then uh, it doesn't last very long. Um, so I won't talk too much about the, the treatment with narcolepsy. I will talk a little bit about the future treatments. But uh, you know, there have been many, many studies, in fact, since the 70s, that have shown that narcolepsy is not a rare disorder. It affects about one person for 2,000, and that's with, with cataplexy. Many, many studies have been done in Hong Kong, in China, in everywhere, like in Italy, in even France, <laughs> uh, everywhere. and it, and the always the same numbers are coming up. What's really surprising too is usually when the patients are uh, discovered, they don't have, uh, uh, you usually find that they don't have um, the, the disease. Uh, they, are, they don't know that they have it. I hope you remember my password. <laughs> so it's bear 2012. <laughs> Very confidential. <laughs> Bear was the name of my narcoleptic dogs that passed away, but now, now I have another one, you know, called Watson, which I, I almost brought today, but you know, it, because he's, he's a Chihuahua, so he's kind of easy to carry. But anyway, so um, uh, so yes, so I don't know where I was, but then I think now, um, so B with a capital B, <laughs> Bear. 2012. So um, I, will, I will try to cover all these different things. So narcolepsy, so cataplexy, the treatment with narcolepsy initially was with stimulants and with antidepressants. So stimulants work very well to keep patients awake, uh, but they don't work very well on cataplexy and the abnormal dreaming. And then uh, in uh, the other treatment for uh, uh, narcolepsy that uses is, uh, is antidepressants, they suppress REM sleep, and that really helps a lot for cataplexy. 
and the abnormal dreaming, but it doesn't work for sleepiness. And then more recently, there have been Zyram or GHB that has been really a game changer that makes people sleep better at night. And then somehow we, you know, you get, uh, people get less sleepy and they, everything improves. So a combination of these three types of drugs usually is the best uh, to treat patients with narcolepsy. So I, mm -hmm. I'm trying to see if I should just go without slide, and that's fine. I have done it before. We were just talking about it. <laughs> you have to adapt to every circumstances. So um, nobody really knew the cause of narcolepsy um, be, when I started. And we knew it was common, and that's the main reason I started to study this disease, because it was not rare, but nobody else was studying it, and believe me, nobody cared. Uh, not to say that people care that much more nowadays, because still there is no funding at NIH, but uh, still, you know, at the time, nobody had heard about it. And I would talk to, my, to other neurologists, and they would say, oh, narcolepsy, it's super, super rare. I never see any patients, and yet it's just we're not diagnosing them. So. Um, how do you diagnose narcolepsy? I'm just trying to assess if I will get the slide back or not. So is it like uh, hopeless? Or uh, it doesn't matter to me. I can, I can adjust, but then I will probably go completely five minutes, one minute. OK, so I will just kind of keep kind of talking without going off track. OK. <laughs> So you want to hear about my dogs, okay. <laughs> so yeah, so I, it, it, as you probably know and will hear, uh, one of the major progress we made in understanding the cause of narcolepsy is nobody could really find uh, you know, the cause of narcolepsy. And we had these narcoleptic dogs that were first uh, you know, gathered by Dr. Dement, who is my mentor at Stanford. In the 70s, he really gave a talk to uh, uh, physicians, and he described different sleep disorders, sleep apnea and narcolepsy, and someone in the audience say, oh, but I have a dog like this. He, every time he gets excited, he's paralyzed, and he sleeps all the time. So unfortunately, at that time, in the 70s, it was very different from nowadays. Dogs that had a defect didn't survive very long. So in fact, the dog was already, had already been euthanized. But then it gave him the idea of trying to find more dogs with narcolepsy. And very soon after, they found a dog, a French poodle, Monique, <laughs> that, that had narcolepsy. And then they started to collect different dogs with narcolepsy. And they tried to breed them, but they couldn't find a genetic transmission of narcolepsy. Because like in humans, most cases of narcolepsy are not very genetic. There is some predisposition, but it's not a very strong genetic predisposition. But then, in 1977, they found this litter of Dobermans that all had, uh, that all had, that's good, that all, all had uh, narcolepsy. And that comes exactly to the right slide. Where, <laughs> uh, but in this particular case, it was very odd because all the dogs at the genetic form of narcolepsy, so completely different from humans. If you bred two dogs with narcolepsy, they all had narcolepsy. So at the time, I was crazy enough to think that maybe I could find the genes that caused this problem by breeding these dogs. And then we had a big adoption program. Some developed narcolepsy, some did not develop narcolepsy. We're taking blood sample. It was, you know, sometime I had to go at midnight to feed the little litters with bottles of milk. It was pretty intense. And uh, we followed the pedigrees of the dogs and the genes. And after 10 years, we finally found the gene. It was really hard. It was like finding a needle in an ASAC. I mean, it's not like right now, where everything is mapped. You know, at the time, no, the, the dog genome was like no man's land. Nobody really knew what it was. And uh, so it took a very long time. But uh, it was really worth the reward, because what we found is a mutation that caused narcolepsy in dog was a mutation in a single protein gene that was called hypocretin receptor, or orexin receptor. And it's basically a receptor for a little peptide, a little chemical called hypocretin or orexin, that when it was stimulating the receptor, was basically producing wakefulness. So when you didn't have this receptor, you had narcolepsy in dogs, and uh, that showed that it was going to be very important to regulate sleep. And in fact, uh, there are drugs that have been already 
uh, discovered that blocks the hypocretin receptor and actually produce sleep, and they are used as sleeping pills. And fortunately, as you will hear, we want the opposite. We want drugs that stimulate the hypocretin for patients with narcolepsy, because that's what they don't have. But it will take a, probably a little longer. But really, this indicated that the cause of dog narcolepsy was a mutation in the hypocretin receptor. So the next thing we did was to look in humans. What, what is it in humans? And we knew it was different, because in humans, it was not purely genetic. It was not like the dogs. We had, I had a lot of patients who marry with each other, and they didn't have kids with narcolepsy. So it couldn't be genetic, like in the dog. Uh, and in fact, what we found is that it was not the receptor that was abnormal. It was a little chemical that is produced by the cells, by about 2,000, 20,000 cells in the, uh, hypocretin, in the hypothalamus, the region deep in the brain that I told you were damaged in the encephalitis lethargica uh, post-flu epidemic. And when they are destroyed, you have no more of these hypocretin peptides that cannot stimulate the receptor, and you have narcolepsy. So as you see, the cause of narcolepsy actually, at least with cataplexy, is very simple. It's just basically you have no more of this hypocretin or rexin uh, molecule, which is produced by about 20,000 cells in the brain. And once they are gone, you know, you cannot stay awake because this particular molecule in the brain stimulates your brain to stay awake and to control your dreams. So uh, the, now after this, there have been a number of next questions. First is, why are these hypocretin cells missing? Is that right? That's probably the most important. And really, that's what we are trying to answer. That's probably the main things that I have in my lab doing. So one is, what is the genetic predisposition? Why people, some people develop narcolepsy and what others do not uh, um, you know, develop narcolepsy? How the genes are working to predispose to narcolepsy? Um, um, yes, the problem is I don't have my glasses. <laughs> what are the environmental factors that are involved? Uh, and, and then, as you will see, it's an autoimmune disease, so the uh, immune system is really involved in narcolepsy. And then you will see that one of the key questions, thank you, <clears throat> somehow, when, you know, when you're a little shy, it's good not to put your glasses, but it can have side effects, you know? <laughs> so what are the autoantigens? And then, um, as you will see, what is really the target of the immune system that really kills the apocretin cells? And then can we find a way to diagnose narcolepsy better? And then is there a spectrum? So I'm going to try to answer all these questions through my talk. So uh, after we found the cause of narcolepsy was the lack of this chemical called hypocretin or rexin in the brain that the cells were destroyed, uh, we kind of suspected that it was autoimmune because of this HLA association, but we couldn't really find anything still in the immune system that was involved. So we did more genetics. And the way you do that now is, the gene, now the genome of the human is completely known. So you, know, you can kind of take this little long post mark, genetic markers and you can screen all the chromosomes very quickly. It's called a genome-wide association study. It has been done with, for almost everything. You just take thousands of patients with narcolepsy and thousands of controls and you study about one million different genetic markers all through the 21 chromosomes of humans, and you find the ones that are different between narcolepsy and controls. And when you do that, of course, what you find, it gives you more uh, idea of what is the cause of narcolepsy. And indeed, what you find is all immune genes, all the genes we found that predispose to narcolepsy, human narcolepsy, uh, they all control the immune system. I want to mention again, they are not very strong factors predisposing narcolepsy, because it's not just genes that produce narcolepsy, but you have certain genes that makes you more predisposed to it. And all of them, as you can see here, one of them is called HLA, which is very important for the immune system. Another one is called the T-cell receptor, which is actually the receptor that interact with the HLA to produce immune responses. And then there are others, uh, genes that regulate the immune system, and some of them are known to to uh, regulate viral infection. So it gives us an idea that definitely narcolepsy is, involves the immune system. And one of the most important genes that we found is this T-cell receptor. We suggest that there are immune cells that are called T-cells that are, must be very important for the uh, genetic predisposition to narcolepsy. 
uh, the HLA system, uh, uh, and then we found some other uh, genetic factors that uh, seem to uh, regulate more the response of certain immune cells called dendritic cells to flu infection. Uh, for example, this particular genetic marker here uh, is associated with narcolepsy with a very high p-value. So when people have this genetic marker, they are more, more susceptible to narcolepsy. And we found that when you have this genetic marker, you have a different response in certain immune cells called dendritic cells when they are infected by the flu. So we are starting to get an idea really how I'm going to pass because I know we, we, I lost a little bit of time. So you, we are really starting to get an idea of exactly what happened in the cause of narcolepsy. And it's pretty simple based on the genes that we have found. Uh, you have these antigen-presenting cells called dendritic cells. They are the cells of the immune system that take virus and break them in little pieces. And then uh, these little pieces of virus and, and bacteria are then glued on these HLA molecules called class two, which are associated with narcolepsy. And then these are recognized by a set of T cells that are called CD4 cells. They're a little bit like the general of the immune system that then coordinate an immune response, that then stimulate another group of T cells that's called CD8 cells that kill normally uh, virally infected cells, but in the case of narcolepsy, they make a mistake. They actually kill uh, the apocretin neurons. So basically, the cause of narcolepsy is really that you have this uh, uh, abnormal response to a flu that then escalate, and instead of killing uh, virally infected cells in your lung, et cetera, as they make a mistake and it kills the cells that produce hypocretin in your brain, and then you have narcolepsy. And why we discovered that the flu was involved was by two different studies, two very weird findings we made. One of them was in China. In China, when I started to work in, on narcolepsy in 2004, they didn't even know what it was. In fact, uh, they, the person that worked on narcolepsy, Dr. Han, I explained that catap what cataplexy was, and I told him, you have to try antidepressant, and he told me, oh, my, my God, it really works. <laughs> they, they didn't have any difference between cataplexy and sleepiness. But anyway, but it's still sad because they don't have a lot of treatment. But what is very nice in, in China is that they have thousands and thousands of patients now because it's a big population. So actually, I wrote a little article on the web, and they diagnosed thousands of patients. Now they have like 4,000 patients in, in China, and even more, actually, just in one center. It's a big population. What is very odd is that unlike in, in, uh, in uh, I would say, um, uh, here, when we were seeing patients with narcolepsy, we were seeing a lot of adults. You know, people who already had narcolepsy for a long time. It's changing now because of the awareness. But definitely in China, all of the uh, patients that they were seeing were very young patients, very close to onset. And when patients are older with narcolepsy, they have adapted to it. <clears throat> and it's definitely not the same disease. Whereas when you start very young, it's very abrupt. So the patient who start narcolepsy when they're five years, seven years old, sometimes as young as two years old, it's, the onset is usually extremely abrupt. So the parents can tell you, oh, my child, he was totally fine that month, and that month he was falling asleep all the time, sleeping, gained an enormous amount of weight, has his tongue fall down and was paralyzed. It's very dramatic. So the parents, when they are kids, can tell you exactly when it starts. Whereas in adults, it's much harder. They often don't remember, or it started much more slowly, and they don't really know when it started. So that's a big advantage because you can time exactly the months when it starts. And as you see here in this graph, we plotted different years and different months where narcolepsy started in, in these patients in China because they were all children. We don't really know why, but I think one of the reasons it's a one-child policy. People really care about their children and, and they have much more, you know, that's probably one of the reasons. And as you see, it's very funny, it's just this bumpy kind of, uh, you know, very clear bump always during the summer. So it looked like most cases of narcolepsy started during the summer. And indeed, what we uh, figured out is that, it's a, is that probably people get infected during the winter with the flu or something, and then it takes, you know, like several months, they fight the flu with an immune response, which starts to attack 
uh, the flu first, and then Hippocratin cells, and then you develop narcolepsy about six months or five months later because you have no more Hippocratin cells and you have narcolepsy with cataplexy. The second thing we discovered is look what happened in 2009. So maybe some of you remember, but in 2009 there was this famous swine flu. So the flu is a very strange beast. It's every, every year, it kind of mutates a little bit, it adapts. So usually we have the same flu than the year before. So right now, for example, there is a couple of strain of flus that are very common. There is the H1N1 2009, this one, that, is, that now is a seasonal flu. Everyone gets it, but it's kind of, an, humans have adopt, adapted to it. Then there is the H3N2, which is actually Hong Kong flu that first started in 1967. And then there are some rarer flus, um, influenza B, et cetera. And then you get this trivalent or quadrivalent vaccine that contain all these strains. But once every 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, sometimes there is a new flu that emerge. And the way it happened is that the flu infects all animals, dog, I mean, it's incredibly versatile, but it infects actually a lot of birds as well as pigs. And sometimes you have a pig farmer, usually it's from pig, that works with pig, and the pig gets the flu, and the humans get another flu, a human flu, and then when they get both flus, the flu kind of recombine together and creates a new flu that sometimes, most often, it cannot go to the next human, so it's it specialized for the, the, the swines, but that sometimes a new mixed flu can jump to another uh, species, and then you have a totally new flu that circulates, and it's very dramatic because no one has an immunity against it, and it can kill millions of people. So that's what happened in 1918. So when this 2009 flu came up, people got very alarmed because it started in Mexico, and the fatality rate was about 0.9%, which means that uh, about 1% of people were infected were dying. That's huge because when you get the flu, you all have had the swine flu by now. So if 1% of you were dead, that would be a lot of people, I can tell you. There would have been millions and millions of people. So people panicked a little bit because it was in, in May, and, and they knew that the winter that was coming, it was going to invade the entire world because, you know, these new flus that just go through the entire world in one season. So people tried to develop a new vaccine to prevent this new flu because it was not ready. The, the regular vaccine was going to be the old flu that is evolving every year. And something also a little weird happened is only in Sweden, uh, only in Europe, they created a very particular vaccine. We, don't, we still don't understand exactly why. That was called Pandemrix that was used, it's kind of a very strange vaccine that contains the swine flu, but it also contains a very strong adjuvant to make the response much stronger. And it would be complicated to explain, but it's a very specific vaccine. And nobody really knows completely why, but this vaccine triggered a lot of flu in young kids in Europe. Not in the US, I must reassure you, because it was not available in US. It was only available in Europe. But as you see, it increased the risk of developing narcolepsy about tenfold, which is huge. I mean, it's a big effect. But by the way, I don't want to panic you because even with that vaccine that looked really, that triggered a lot of narcolepsy, an increased risk of tenfold is not necessarily as high as you think. Because every year, one child, one year, has about a risk of one for a million, one for 100,000 to develop narcolepsy. So one child for 100,000 developed narcolepsy every year. And with the vaccine, it came up to about one for uh, 10,000. So clearly, you know, still most people who were vaccinated did not develop the flu, but still it increased about 10 times the risk of developing narcolepsy. So still it gave us a very big clue. So these two results told us that's clear. It must be the flu that's really triggering narcolepsy. And indeed, now, we actually have some good idea how it's working. In particular, for example, we started to study the genetics of the people who have developed narcolepsy with the vaccination. So you can compare people who develop narcolepsy spontaneously when they're infected by the flu versus those that have developed it after the vaccination. And that gives you an idea of which of the genetic factors modulate the response to the flu versus the response to the immune response to the flu. So, for example, now we have a really some good ideas of how things are working. You know, we think that what happened is 
people develop the flu, and then this particular cell called antigen-presenting cells, dendritic cells, eat up the flu, and in these cells, interferon gamma is very important for the response of the cells to the flu, and that's why actually this uh, genetic factors associated with interferon makes people more predisposed, but only to the cases after flu infection, not after vaccination. And then it kind of triggers a response of this particular cell called CD4 and CD8, who then go into the brain, and something gets confused in the context of these HLA molecules with, uh, um, MH, or called MHC, uh, with the flu versus hypocretin neurons, and then you kill hypocretin neurons. So really, what we are doing now, if there is one question I want to answer in the future, is I want to find what the immune system is confusing in the flu versus hypocretin neurons. Why? Because if we find what it is, then we'll have a blood test for narcolepsy. That will change everything. We'll be able to take a blood sample and say this person has narcolepsy. And most likely, as you can see, it will be revolutionary because we'll discover probably a lot of people who have mild narcolepsy who really understand a lot more about narcolepsy. And of course, people will be screened by GPs. I mean, so that's one of my main research focus, is to find what piece of the virus or what piece of the hypocretin cells are being confused by the immune system. And one of those ways we do that is we really are inspired by the vaccine itself because there is this very specific vaccine, Pandemrix. I'm sure you can imagine it's very weird that it triggered so much narcolepsy. So we think that in this particular vaccine, there must be something special. So we are really analyzing this vaccine very carefully to figure out why it's different from other vaccines. And in fact, uh, we, we found some specific pieces of the virus that are more specific of the vaccine versus other viruses. And we are developing this new technique that's called tetramer, where it's very, very interesting. You can take this HLA molecule and glue a piece of the vaccine that you're interested in and make it fluorescent, and it can detect the specific T cells that recognize this particular complex. And just to show you, for example, now we have screened thousands of little pieces of, vac of virus, and we have found some specific piece of the virus that definitely seems to be more recognized by patients who develop narcolepsy than patients who did not develop narcolepsy, including people who have been vaccinated with pandemics. So we start to have a clue of how the immune response has been different in people who develop narcolepsy and people who don't develop narcolepsy, and that I think is going to lead us to this mystery uh, antigen that is being actually recognized by patients and kill hypocretin cells. Um, so that's really most of, of the work we are doing. So if I had one wish is I want to find that little piece of the virus and that little piece of hypocretin cells that's really be confused by the immune system because then we'll be able to find the T cells and screen all of you for these T cells and be able to diagnose narcolepsy with a blood test. And also we may be even able to prevent patients from developing narcolepsy by vaccinating differently, et cetera. But that will be a longer story. So that's one aspect of my research. The second aspect that I've done, mostly funded by Jazz Pharmaceuticals, is the MSLT that's used for narcolepsy is really very long and cumbersome, and I would like to find a way that we can screen narcolepsy only with a single uh, sleep study. So you wouldn't need uh, to do the nap test. That would be wonderful, because maybe we could even do it at home. You know, for sleep apnea now, people wear this PSG at home, and you can directly uh, diagnose sleep apnea, if we could do the same for narcolepsy, or even if everyone that is doing that for sleep apnea, you could analyze it and say, oh, this person has narcolepsy, people would be diagnosed much more easily. So to do that, we have, you know, you know, I'm sure a lot of you, if you are close to the Silicon Valley, everyone talks about machine learning. It's almost exhausting. You know, why? Because machine learning is a big revolution that's happening in computer science, and it's a little scary, actually. It comes from so, for example, don't do anything wrong and put your picture on the, on the web because you can be found in two minutes because with this new machine learning uh, techniques. And it really made a lot of progress, especially with visual recognition. So the way it works is very simple, is you really have, let's say that you feed the computer pictures of cat and human and dog. So you, anyone can recognize a cat, a human, and a dog. So you annotate this picture. You have people who say, this is a cat, this is a dog, this is a human. And then the picture is scanned by the computer, 
and then being separated in all these little squares, and then goes through the filters that I showed you right on, uh, on the bottom right, and they will just decide, you know, yes, no, yes, no, and it's an immense tree for each of these pixels that says this particular piece of the image looks like this or doesn't look like this. And amazingly, and then at the end it said dogs, cat, dogs, cat, humans, and then at the end, the computer will learn all the pathways through all these trees of decision to say this is a cat, this is a dog. And, I, and it actually at the end can recognize a cat and a dog. So for example, now it can recognize anyone in the room. It's very efficient. That's how Facebook can, you know, with your pictures, it can find all the pictures of you doing bad things on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so it's also used a lot for uh, speech recognition, that was translation, etc. It's a big revolution, and that's called machine learning or artificial intelligence. And there's different type of machine learning, but we really have applied that to sleep scoring, for example. Right now, you know, it's ideal for sleep because when you do a sleep recording, all of you have gone through this. You know, you have all these electrodes, this EEG, you stop breathing, but then you have technicians that say, "Ah, oh, this is." deep sleep, this is REM sleep, this is this, this is this. You have an apnea, you don't have an apnea. So it's really like cat, dogs, you know, it's exactly the same. It's really human, uh, human annotations. So we really transform the signal in many different ways and we feed it to this network the same way as it would be an image. And then we find ways of recognizing these patterns. And at the end, you know, it's quite complicated, but it's just to show you that if you take six people or even thousands of people uh, that have screened, that have looked at the same sleep study and decided for each of the studies, this is REM sleep, this is not REM sleep, etc. Uh, at the end, you can show that you, the computer does better than a single human. So it actually does better than a combination of humans. So nowadays, I think in five years, nobody will score sleep study. Humans won't do it. It'll be like a direct computer that reads the sleep study and say, this is REM sleep, etc. So it's a real revolution in this field. Uh, and uh, so we try to apply that to narcolepsy as well. So after we use some of these features to try to say, can the computer recognize the sleep study? Is it narcolepsy or is it not narcolepsy? And in fact, the computer detected some specific features that could say this is narcolepsy or not. Uh, for example, how fast it goes into REM sleep, of course, but also how REM sleep looks like wake, because as you know, patients with narcolepsy often experience this mixed state where they're half awake and half in REM sleep, and basically detected a number of features that it used to make a decision, yes, no, in this usual tree. And then it, at the end, we found a way to diagnose narcolepsy as well as the MSLT. So we think this is going to change a lot the way we diagnose narcolepsy, because now you'll be able to use a single night of sleep study to diagnose narcolepsy. No more need for the nap test. So that will make a big difference. And of course, in the future, I, I think, you know, this old sleep study where you have all this like wires and so forth is completely crazy. It's out of date. We already have all this actigraph, et cetera, that you wear. They are not good enough, but the technology is moving so fast. Like for example, right now, we're working with engineering, they can actually have some biomaterial that they can put on the uh, skin, and it almost looks like a tape, you see, and it has circuits, like, uh, and it electrodes, and it can detect signals, and you see it's very simple. So I, I anticipate that in a few years, we won't even go to sleep lab. You'll be able to go to home, your home, have a couple of this stuff on you, and it will automatically measure sleep and maybe diagnose narcolepsy, see how you're doing, etc. So the applications are way beyond narcolepsy, of course. Um, so with that, uh, so this is the main progress. So if I summarize my talk right now, there's one thing I'm looking for is these T cells that as a blood biomarker for narcolepsy. But this is really, really like a looking at a needle in an sac. It's a little bit the same thing as when I was looking for the narcolepsy gene. It took me 10 years. This one will t probably take me years. We'll find it. We're screening through thousands and thousands of pieces of flu and pieces of human protein. And one day we'll find one, and that will be it. Uh, the second thing uh, uh, we are starting to study also is, is there a spectrum of patients with narcolepsy? Uh, so, in fact, it's complicated uh, because type 1 narcolepsy, uh, which, so when hypocretin was found as a cause of human narcolepsy, people look at patients with cataplexy and they found that everyone had low hypocretin. So if you have cataplexy, 
it's very clear, you, the cause is the lack of hypocretin. If you don't have cataplexy, it's much more complicated. It looks like there is a small percent that don't have hypocretin, maybe 10% or so. So some of them don't have cataplexy, and, uh, and then they still have no hypocretin. And then if you follow these people over years, about half will develop cataplexy over time, uh, over 10 years or 20 years, but half would never develop cataplexy. Uh, but we know then consequently that there are some cases that don't have cataplexy and have low hypocretin. But if you have, unfortunately, a lot of these patients are not diagnosed. And we know that probably those are out there, but they don't go to see the clinic. And the way, why we know that is, in, especially in families. I used to say that uh, narcolepsy in, in family was quite rare, uh, and it is true. If you take one patient with narcolepsy and cataplexy, and you ask all the first degree relative, only about 1% have narcolepsy, which is a low risk. So if you have narcolepsy with cataplexy, the risk of your children having narcolepsy is only 1% with cataplexy. Uh, so if you have 100 children, you have to start to worry, but I, <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that that's not the case for anyone, <laughs> even with genetic engineering. Uh, and however, we discovered that if you take the cases without cataplexy, there's definitely more cases, maybe two or three uh, percent. So there is probably some spectrum. And we, in, in, uh, Japan, uh, in China, we even could study some of these people with, with uh, lumbar puncture to see if they had low hypocretin, and we discovered that some of them do. So it's very clear that there is definitely, especially in family members of patients with narcolepsy, milder form of narcolepsy, that have no cataplexy, but they still have low hypocretin and the same cause somehow. And I believe that in the general population, there is a lot more of these people, but they don't go to see the doctor because they just nap, they're a little more tired. It's not a dramatic phenotype. Um, so now, you know, because of this, there is a, a new definition of narcolepsy that have come about. Uh, you know, you have type 1 narcolepsy, which is caused by this hypocretin, lack of hypocretin cells. And usually when you do the, the sleep test, they are always positive. And uh, usually they have cataplexy. Uh, however, there is also what we call night type 2 narcolepsy. When you do the sleep test, you know, it's like narcolepsy, but they don't have cataplexy. And in some cases, as I mentioned, there is definitely low hypocretin that cause the problem. In the population, there's probably a lot of these people, but they don't go to see the doctor. And for the people that go to see the doctor, a lot of them have this test that's positive, but truly when you do the, lum the lumbar puncture, you don't find any abnormality of hypocretin. And we are discovering now uh, that in fact, these cases that don't have normal hypocretin, very often the MSLT is actually a false positive. I'm sorry to say that, but basically if you repeat the test when they go into SOREM, REM sleep, a second time, very often it becomes normal. So really, a lot of people, this is what actually Chad Ruff, who is here, actually uh, sh you know, showed recently, is that if you take, do this uh, test of MSLTs that we use to diagnose narcolepsy with the transition to REM sleep, it's a good test, you know, because in narcolepsy with cataplexy, it's 95% positive in patients with narcolepsy cataplexy, and only 5% controls are positive. But 5% control is still a lot. I mean, because there are a lot more people who have sleep apnea or are tired without a reason. So when you do this test to everyone, you just have a few false positive. And then when you repeat it, very often, it just doesn't repeat. So the conclusion of that is that if you have the low hypocretin, the MSLT finding is really reliable and you can repeat it. But if you don't have cataplexy very often and hypocretin deficiency, the finding of, a, of an MSLT positive is probably by chance. And I know it's a little alarming for you, for you guys. The reason being that, unfortunately, if you have a positive MSLT, people pay for your medication. And if you don't have a positive MSLT, people don't pay for your medication, which is the most stupid thing that has ever been done because in my opinion, patients with idiopathic hypersomnia that don't necessarily have a positive MSLT, they're suffering as much as people who have a SOREM. I mean, they are as bad. I mean, many people are really, and, and can benefit from the same treatment. So I think in the future, it's very likely that there will be two types of narcolepsy. 
One will be the narcolepsy type 1, which is low hypocretin and so forth, and maybe we'll have blood markers that show that it's autoimmune, and maybe there will be mild cases in the population, and then there will be a, a type 2, and in my opinion, it will be merged with idiopathic hypersomnia, because it will be just people who are tired and fall asleep very quickly on an MSLT, but not necessarily having REM sleep, because the REM sleep is not so important. What is important is whether or not they are really tired and, and need medication and they should be actually treated the same. Um, so one other question is what are these uh, other cases of, of hypersomnia and, and, and narcolepsy without cataplexies that don't involve hypocretin? So we actually discovered a couple of things that make it, or we and other people, that make it very interesting uh, for the future research. So first, there is a disorder that called Klein-Levin syndrome that probably no one of you ever heard. It's very rare but it's very odd. They are adolescent, they are totally normal, they, find they are fine, and then suddenly they become extremely sleepy, but it's like so bad that they sleep for t 20 hours all the time, they can't even wake up. And then they do that every day, every day for about 10 or 20 days, and then finished. They find totally normal, and then they are normal for months, two months, three months, and boom, it restarts exactly the same way. And this go on and off for like 10 years, 20 years, and then it gets better with time. And often when they are young adults, 35, it's, it, they are becoming normal. It's a very odd pathology. It's kind of this sleepiness on and off with a lot of sleep. So it's different from narcolepsy. They really sleep a lot of hours. In addition, when they are, when they are sleeping in this episode, they are not normal. If you just try to wake them up, they are very aggressive. They can't even talk. They feel very foggy. In fact, they don't remember anything of the episodes. They look much more like hypersomnia. They are always very, very tired and unable to, to sleep, uh, to, uh, to wake up, and they are irritable, and it's terrible. I mean, in fact, sometimes they eat some kind of weird food. They are disinhibited. They are really not just sleepy. They are just like in some kind of half coma, half awake. And nobody knew the cause of this problem. And a little bit like human narcolepsy, I have to tell you, I'm a very persistent person. So I have been studying this on the side, you know, for, 20, for 15 years. And this is a rare disorder, so we accumulated sample. And finally, we had 600 samples, and we did a genetic study. And when we found what's very interesting, because we found the genetic factors that predispose to this particular condition that increase the risk about twice, which is actually a pretty big factor. And this is in a region of a, a gene called TRANK1. What's interesting is we, we still don't know exactly how it's working, but what is very interesting is this particular gene has always been and uh, also been involved in schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, but much lower risk factor. I mean, in, in uh, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, people have studied like 10,000 people or 20,000 or 50,000. And when they do that, they find a risk in the TRANK1 region, but only a risk increased 10%, not twofold like we find in Klein-Levin syndrome. So it looks like there is some uh, relationship with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And it's interesting because, you know, some, especially bipolar disorder is like on and off. You know, sometimes it's on, sometimes it's off. And interestingly, it works, it's treated with lithium. And, and Klein-Levin syndrome, we have put some people on lithium and it helps some of these patients. So it seems that there is an overlap between these two pathologies that we didn't really suspect at all. And more and more now people are taking this huge sample. But for example, there is a study in the British Biobank in England where they have studied 500,000 people. And they ask about their sleep. Do you like to sleep? Do you don't like to sleep? How much time you sleep? And what they are finding is the people who sleep too much, it seems that the same genes, again, that makes you sleep too much have some overlap with the genes that have been found for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. So it looks like there is some common mechanism between have needing more sleep and some of this mood dysregulation, et cetera, that is associated with uh, uh, bi especially bipolar disorder. So I think we are starting to learn that, that there is probably two very big different types. There is a narcolepsy with hypocretin, cataplexy, et cetera, and there is an hypersomnia much more complicated. If you exclude sleep apnea and all the secondary thing, probably you are left with a tiny bit of this 
uh, genetic predisposition that seems to overlap with bipolar disorder and mood, certain mood disorder, not all mood disorders. So that's why actually a lot of these patients are always try antidepressants and I think we have to, to be a bit more creative in how we treat these patients. So the last piece of my, uh, do I have still time? Okay, so the last uh, piece of my talk will be about treatments, because what's exciting is we are getting a lot of new treatments. So one of them is this new uh, stimulant that looks a little bit like modafinil, but instead of working only on dopamine, it works on both dopamine and noepinephrine. So it's a little bit like a mix of modafinil and stratera, which both of them I use for patients with narcolepsy or hypersomnia, and it seems to be uh, very effective uh, the, the clinical studies are done. We are waiting for the results, but I think uh, it's pretty clear that it works based on, on, on what the patient report. Um, you have all heard that some people have also suggested, so that's more like all treatment improved. Uh, another thing that is coming is, you probably heard of the work of David Rye, that has suggested that in a number of these patients with hypersomnia, there is too much of a GABA enhancing uh, product in the CSF. I have to, and then he had this idea that maybe if you block the GABA, you know, some people will improve, and he has used this drug called clarithromycin, which is an antibiotic that also has a blocking GABA property of flumazenil, and shown that some of these patients improve with the treatment. I have to caution you about, a little bit about this, because I always say that for research to be really good, you have to have to, your worst enemy actually replicate your finding. Like, for example, my hypocretin finding, you know, it has been replicated by everyone, even people who hate my guts. They still kind of, you know, <laughs> had to say, yes, it is true. And they, that's what you want. And this is definitely not the case. Unfortunately, it's only David Wright that I found it. That doesn't mean it's not right. We just don't know yet. And in fact, uh, there's one person that tried to replicate it that did not replicate it. But, uh, you know, there's always technical issues, so time will tell. But uh, there is suggestions that maybe some patients with hypersomnia could involve, you know, too much GABA. Uh, and uh, in that direction, there is an old drug that really uh, blocks GABA that, has been, that is being developed as a clinical trial as well uh, to try to treat patients with hypersomnia. So that's another, you know, exciting area where maybe by uh, inhibiting GABA, you could treat some patients with hypersomnia, the ones that don't have the lack of hypocretin. And then a, a, a third uh, pathway is histamine. Some people have suggested that some patients, you, if you take antihistamine, I'm sure you take antihistamine, a lot of you, you know that it makes you sleepy. So the idea is you do the opposite. You try to increase histamine in the brain, and maybe it will make you more awake. And in fact, there's suggestions there, too, that maybe some patients with hypersomnia have too low histamine, that if we could boost their histamine levels, it could make them more awake. And indeed, there is a drug that has been studied mostly in Europe called Pital Pitolizon, uh, which uh, has been, that actually stimulates histamine. Uh, and it seems that in some patients, it's definitely improving sleepiness. It's well established, a lot of clinical trials. It's approved now in Europe. And I think it's coming to the US. And it also seems to reduce cataplexy. Personally, I think it's going to be most useful with patients with idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy without cataplexy, but it also seems to have some positive effect uh, on cataplexy. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the holy grail for me, I, if there's two things I want to do, is one is to find this biomarker of narcolepsy, as uh, the T cells, you know, because then we can diagnose with a blood test, and the second would be to find a way to replace hypocretin, because we give th these patients uh, GAB, you know, GHB, all these drugs, but they don't work on hypocretin. If we could replace the hypocretin, all the patients that have type 1 narcolepsy, especially those with cataplexy, would be whole. That would be what they're really lacking. It should be the perfect treatment. And we know it is, because if you inject hypocretin in a mouse that doesn't have the gene for hypocretin, it has narcolepsy, it collapses, and if you inject it in the brain, all the symptoms disappear. But unfortunately, the hypocretin molecule is too big, so it cannot go into the brain spontaneously, so we have to inject it directly into the brain. And I'm sure none of you would volunteer your children <laughs> for these experiments. I wouldn't, uh, because the current treatment worked reasonably well. But of course, if we could find a small molecule that goes straight into the brain and replace the hypocretin, or the type 1 narcolepsy, it would be a completely game changer. 
And there is some hint that it's feasible. I have to tell you, I've been waiting for 10 years, and every time I talk again, you know, people tell me when, when, when it's coming, when it's coming, and unfortunately, you know, that's something I can't control. At least finding the blood test, I can do it. But finding a drug, that's the job of the pharmaceutical industry. It's a lot of work. I mean, you have to screen thousands and thousands of molecules. I mean, a drug co costs about $500 million. I don't even have 10,000, so <laughs> I don't think it's going to be feasible. So it's really the job of uh, drug companies. And as I mentioned, it has been possible to find drugs that blocks apocretin, but stimulating apocretin is much harder and, and going into the brain. And the reason is that the receptor for hypocretin is like a, a lock, and then the apocretin molecule is like the key. And you can imagine that blocking the key from entering the lock is relatively easy. You just need to find something like a tape, you know, like a big molecule that sort of plugs the stuff, you know, and then it blocks it, and then the apocretin doesn't come. That's why a lot of drugs have been developed that block hypocretin, and they make people narcoleptic for one night, you know, and they help to sleep and more are coming. But finding the opposite, a small molecule that looks like the apocretin and goes in completely snug into the receptor and activates it, that's much harder. It has to have exactly the right conformation. And so that took a while, but I think there is hope that in the future this will happen. And in particular, this uh, group, for example, in uh, Japan has found at least a small molecule. You see it's still big, actually. It's too big. It doesn't enter really well the brain. But it enters a little bit, and they found that it has some effect. So I think it will happen. And of course, rumors always abound that this will happen tomorrow. But you know, I'm going to uh, not say, um, because I don't know. But I think it will happen. Technically, it's totally feasible. It's just a matter of time and luck. By the way, science, luck is very important. Uh, but not to say that hard work is not important. I mean, like for me at least, that always has been hard work, and, uh, hard work unfortunately. So um, the last area would be if we could suppress the immune system to avoid it to develop narcolepsy. And I think that's, again, when we will find the T cells that are involved. We might find vaccination or ways to avoid the immune system to go into the wrong direction to kill hypocretin cells. And there are some definitely direction. And then in, when I will be dead, probably <laughs> we'll be able, but some of the young kids here will be still alive. Uh, unless, of course, we become immortal, like some crazy people think we will be, uh, and we are cloned into computers. But uh, modeling, we will be able to maybe replace hypocretin self itself, and like use stem cells. And indeed, there is someone in my lab that has been able to take skin cells, and then it puts like different chemicals, and then it changes into an, embryo, an embryonic cell, and then it puts other chemical, and then it becomes a neuron, like an hypocretin neuron. And maybe one day we'll be able to re-implant that, and then, poof, people would be cured. Uh, I think it's still uh, you know, a way in the, in the future, but sometimes I'm surprised how fast it goes. Like this machine learning, for example, in three years, it's just like exponential. So you really never know. And I have to tell you, there's so little uh, funding in, your, in this general area of science, that if there were as much funding as in computer science, in, in biological science, probably we could make miracle. Um, so, yes. So in conclusion, uh, narcolepsy is really an auto, type one we understand well. It's an autoimmune disease that affects apocretin neurons. There's probably a, a, a spectrum of some patients we have low hypocretin, no cataplexy, but these people really don't go to the clinic because they nap a little more. They don't feel like it's a really severe disease. That's what we see in families of patients with narcolepsy. And there are new diagnostic markers that are coming, definitely with the PSG and machine learning, maybe genetics, and I'm hoping with the T cell. Um, and then we know that it's a combination of genetic predisposition and then probably the flu that triggers an abnormal immune response and kills hypocretin neurons. And I'm hoping we'll really find exactly what happened. And I'm hoping that there will be new therapies, including agonist uh, replacement of hypocretin that will come, because that's one of the two things that needs to be done, I think, in this field. And then there's this narcolepsy type two and idiopathic hypersomnia, which in the future, I think people are going to consider that the same. It's more complicated, but probably it involves some genes that overlap a little bit with the pathophysiology of, of bipolar disorder and some of the, at least in some cases, because I'm sure it's very heterogeneous. And there too, I think there's a need for a lot more research and even new drugs 
Uh, and what's good is there are a lot of new drugs that are coming even for type 1 that are going to be applicable. Even if we find an hypocretin or rexin agonist uh, for type 1 narcolepsy where people don't have hypocretin, it will still help people who have type 2. I mean, obviously, I mean, it's like uh, uh, aspirin, you know, you don't use it just for people who, I mean, for anybody that has fever, it can be a symptomatic treatment. So I'm very excited because there's so many drugs coming, the so research is really going well. Uh, I think it's just a matter of a few more years and there will be real transformation. In the last next five years, I think, it's going to make a big difference. The only thing that doesn't go well is really the funding, because for us at least, uh, I am sorry to say that our lab is really reduced to one person working on narcolepsy now, so because uh, the NIH has not been funding our lab for two years, so we pretty much have had to cut all the staff and there's only one person looking for this particular, um, you know, T cells, but soon we are going to have to close, you know, the lab. In 2018, we resubmitted it, but if we don't get it next year, finished. Uh, we have to, uh, to close the, the lab, unfortunately. So hopefully someone else will restart later, but uh, that's a bad news. Um, and, and actually, it's not a very good thing because narcolepsy is relatively common, and it's not like patients can replace what the government should do. You know, it's, you just, there's not enough money. I mean, honestly, my lab, like one person in my lab cost about 150,000 with all the regions, everything. You, it's not like, it, it's, it's expensive. But it's still not that expensive because you think Xyrem is $250,000. Uh, you know, it's just, I mean, my whole program is like three or four people uh, treated with Xyrem, but the government is not interested in narcolepsy. There's no, right now there's no funding in human narcolepsy anymore. So I, I advise you to contact your congressman or try to stimulate a little bit because otherwise not only us, but I think uh, it will put back narcolepsy research many years behind. So thank you so much for your attention, and uh, I'm ready to take any question. And if you have uh, personal questions, I will be around. I'm very happy to talk about clinical questions. Every case is important. I want to help anyone. But uh, it's better if you want to ask questions. I don't know if we can ask questions. Uh, I would prefer to, uh, is there a general question? But maybe there's no time for question. I don't know. Evelyn, do you have questions? No, no question. Okay, so I will be available for questions uh, during the break. Okay, thank you so much for your attention.